I'm sure many of you remember the electronics giant Circuit City. It started out in 1949 as a mom-and-pop TV store in Richmond, Virginia. It rose to become a multi-billion dollar nationwide company. Then, in 2009, Circuit City closed its doors and died. Alan Wurzel is the son of the original founder, and he's a former CEO of Circuit City. He's written about the 60-year rise and fall of the company and the lessons that can be learned from it. His book is called Good to Great to Gone, and he joins me in the studio. Alan, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. We'll get into the details soon, but I wonder if you can boil it down to one strategic mistake that Circuit City <laughs> did that led to its d- demise. Well, one is pushing it, but, but I would say uh, a significant contributing factor was hubris on the parts of management at, during the, the decline of Circuit City. Lots of companies uh, think they know the answers. They think they're uh, smarter than the, than the competition. And when you start thinking that way, you're making a big mistake. Was it Best Buy that did it in? No, I don't think Best Buy. I think it was the inattention to the market share that Best Buy plus Walmart plus other mass merchants had and that Circuit City didn't believe that Best Buy could succeed because its margins were very thin. It was skating on thin ice financially. And uh, the, the then current management thought Best Buy will fall by itself. Let's go back to the very beginning. Your dad, Sam Wurzel, was getting his hair cut <laughs> back in 1949, and he got the idea to start selling TVs. Yeah, I say Circuit City was born in a barber shop. When the barber Where said, all great companies are born, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, he was getting his hair cut and, and visiting, actually, uh, my mother's sister who lived in Richmond and learned that the, bar- the South's first television station had just opened in Richmond. Now, put yourself back to 1949. I mean, the only home entertainment uh, at that time was radio. Uh, there was obviously no Internet. There was no TV. Uh, and so all information and entertainment came over the radio. And he thought, having we lived in New York at the time uh, and seen TV, that TV would be an exciting uh, development with a great future. And he was just very entrepreneurial because most people don't sit and think when they're getting their hair cut, what business can I start? Well, he was at a stage in his life where he needed to be looking for a new business because he just sold uh, the one he, he had been running for 10 years. Uh, and uh, so his ears were open. And But I think, as we'll talk later about habits of mind, but one of the habits of mind that brought success to Circuit City is curiosity. And uh, I think he had curiosity when he heard this. He uh, did some more research. He learned more about uh, Richmond, uh, which he knew casually because we had relatives there. Uh, he learned more about TV and the future of TV. And that led him, you know, two months later, he came back with a dozen TVs that he bought from somebody, uh, a manufacturer in New York, nobody ever heard of them anymore, called Olympic TV, and started this, uh, sold a house and put all his, his savings, the $13,000 was basically his life savings, uh, into this new business. What about your mother? Was she supportive of this idea? She was very supportive. Um, she, she was a wonderful woman, and... Uh, she realized the family needed to do something different to support themselves. And so, and the moving to Richmond where her sister lived was sort of emotionally, uh, you know, important, to, important her. to her. Exactly. So your dad's hiring practices were a bit unorthodox because you said that he liked to hire salesmen who had failed at something else. Correct. He thinks, he thought, and I think there's truth, it's, it's harder to teach an old dog, new tricks, so to speak, uh, a, an, an experienced appliance salesman, and particularly in those days, it was a hard sell strategy of bait and switch and twisting arms to get customers to buy things. Uh, harder to teach those people new ways of selling than to take somebody who was smart, uh, perhaps success, successful in other areas, uh, and willing to learn and willing to work hard and teach them the business rather than unlearn old habits. The book we're discussing is called Good to Great to Gone, The 60-Year Rise and Fall of Circuit City. Alan Wurzel is in the studio with me. He's a former CEO and creator of Circuit City. He was CEO from 1972 to 1986. You went to law school. You were practicing law. Why did you decide to join the company? 
I was practicing a, a very oddball sort of law. I was, the firm represented a number of tribes of American Indians. And it, I was young and idealistic, and it was like being in the Peace Corps. I loved it and, and enjoyed it, but I didn't see it as a long-term career. And so when I, my dad came to me and said, I need to hire a lawyer to, as I want to make some acquisitions. We're now a small public company. I said, well, I'll come down and do it for a couple of years, and in that process, I will learn some law, some business law, some corporate law. But when your dad came to you, he wanted you, right? Not because he, he was saying, "Do you know anybody that can?" He, he did, and he was a he was a devious. I mean, I don't mean uh, inappropriately devious, but he liked to go about things from the back door sometimes, and not just barge in the front door. And so he asked me if I knew anybody. I think I concluded, although he never said that he was angling to try to get me to come. But anyway, it worked. I was interested in doing it, not as a career, but to learn corporate law. So when did you decide that you were going to take over your dad's company? About two weeks later. You I, loved it. I loved it. And I discovered that, that running a business was a lot more interesting and challenging than law. Uh, for I think well, maybe an interesting reason. I think you can, as a lawyer... There's no bottom line. You can write a great brief. You can have a, make a great argument and still lose because you have the wrong judge, the wrong client, the wrong, you know, the wrong facts. Um, in business, there's no escaping the bottom line. If you run a company and it doesn't succeed, you may, it, it, there may be good reasons for a year or two or three because of the economy or whatever. But after a period of time, if the business doesn't turn around, there's no one else that's accountable or responsible. There's a bottom line accountability to running a business. It needs to change if, if change is required to succeed. I wonder if the senior management was resentful of you. You know, here comes the boss's son coming, this young guy taking over the company. Um, there was an element of that, but he had, he had assembled a, a wonderful group of men. And I think uh, they genuinely welcomed the fact that uh, the boss's son was coming in. I mean, I had a, they were self-taught, uh, you know, either a high school dropout or a year or two of college. I mean, they were uh, smart and, and wonderful men. But having someone that had a, a good education and a law degree also had open had thought, thought opened doors for the company. And if they could get along with me, it would be for the benefit of their careers. Was your management style very different from your dad's? Very different. He was he was from the old school. He was he was very uh, protective of people. He was um, a paternal kind was, of that's style. That's the word I'm okay. looking for. It was a paternalistic approach that he had. Um, mine was more you know less less paternalistic, but it was very participatory. I mean, they called him Mr. Wurzel or Mr. Sam. And there was a clear difference between them and, and him in age and authority. They were more my contemporaries. And so we worked more as a team. And my style was to get everybody reporting to me and on the, on the top of the team to talk about these issues and try to reach consensus. Alan Wurzel is in the studio with me. He's the former CEO and creator of Circuit City. He was CEO from 1972 to 1986 and then joined the board until the year 2000. The book is Good to Great to Gone. How big was Circuit City when you took over in 1972? Uh, in 72, it was $50 million in sales. So that's, that's pretty substantial. Yes. But I was surprised to read that in 1974, you came, quote, within a hair breadth of having to file for bankruptcy. How Correct. did that happen? <laughs> it happened because I came in as the lawyer to help him to help the company make a number of acquisitions. And we made, in three or four years, we made uh, half a dozen, most of which turned out to be mistakes. Uh, my dad had a, was a wonderful visionary, a great salesperson, uh, and had a, and fabulous ideas about how to treat people, how to treat suppliers, how to treat customers. But I don't think he, his strengths were, stra were business strategy. And we acquired a lot of mom and pop businesses. He thought he could roll it up and get a number of similar companies all under one umbrella. And as a public company, there were economic advantages to that. And we did not do adequate due diligence. And a number of the companies we acquired didn't fit 
together, and not a, some of them didn't even work. And so we were left with a mess, and it was compounded by the fact that the, 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 the economic engine of the business was running TV and appliance departments in other people's discount stores. That was the, the real growth and success of the business. And when all of those discount chains, four or five of them, uh, filed Chapter 11 in 73, in the recession of 73, the company had you know, problems on the revenue side and the income side and had saddled itself with these uh, misfit uh, acquisitions. So do you think that during the, the great years, right, when things were going really well and things took off, was it just a matter of being at the right industry at the right time, or was it really good management? I think it was being, you know, I was to say if my dad had been in the shoe business, it would, it, it, Circuit City would not have been nearly as successful. So we were certainly in the most dynamic segment of American retailing. I mean, the changes in products from the black and 13-inch black and white TVs to uh, today the Internet or the cloud over 60 years is un believable. And the change in retailing from mom and pop stores to discount stores to big box stores to specialty stores to internet stores, that's been a... So we were in the right place at the right time. A big piece of it is luck. But the most critical piece, there were other people all over the country, mom and pop, you know, stores not unlike Circuit City that were regionally significant in Detroit and Chicago and Los Angeles and wherever, uh, that didn't make it. And I think the reason for Circuit City's success was the emphasis on strategic planning. We, when I first took over as CEO, the board said to me, you've got, I forget, six months or a year to come up with a strategic plan and not one that flies by the seat of its pants, but it's well thought out and well researched. Et this is a three-year plan. Yes. And so I did a three-year plan. And looked at a lot of alternatives. And most important, I looked at our strengths and weaknesses. And strategic planning, I think, is the art and science of aligning the strengths of an organization to the external environment, what's happening in the, to the real world. How do you capture customers? That's where you need a focus. And what strengths does the organization have in uh, creating a, a, a customer, creating a strategy that, that's profitable? We came up with what's now known as the Circuit City Superstore, which was a big box. It replaced in Richmond four or five regional or local uh, stores. And what's the benefit of that, just having everything in one place, benefits, or is it an economy of scale? The benefits for the consumer is huge selection. The benefits for the retailer is reduced inventory because you don't have to duplicate it in five different places. Better supervision of the sales force, a concentration of effort and a focus, and the ability to, to persuade customers legitimately that you're uh, a big and important uh, factor that can buy it at low prices, that services what it sells, that they'll be taken care of, that you're a responsible um, major uh, enterprise, which you don't, you don't deliver that impression with five or six regional or neighborhood stores. In 1981, you were 48 years old. You had been at Circuit City for 15 years, and you weren't having fun anymore. No, I wouldn't say that. I was still having fun. But why but, did you want to leave? What I say is the learning curve had flattened out. I mean, the first time you build a 30 or 40,000 square foot store for a million bucks or two million bucks. It's really cool. It's cool. I mean, second time, not so cool. <laughs> well, the second time, and even the fifth and the tenth, but by the 25th, You've sort of seen all the challenges. I mean, in, there, in, it, in all of these, there are uh, challenges. There are zoning challenges and, uh, you know, building challenges and union challenges. But when you've done quite a few of them, then those patterns seem to repeat themselves. And the same was true for warehousing. The same was true for selling stock to the public. I mean, there are a lot of the interesting things I'd done a few times. And I thought, A, somebody with a fresh insight might be able to do it better. And then I was interested in um, going out and, and, and uh, trying new challenges and maybe making selling TVs at a, uh, at a great bargain, I think, is an important social service. But I also, the, the thing that drove me to be an Indian lawyer and to help people in, in deep need uh, was not being served at Circuit City. 
So it was a combination. The book we're discussing is called Good to Great to Gone, The 60-Year Rise and Fall of Circuit City. Alan Wurzel is in the studio with me, former CEO. He was CEO from 1972 to 1986 and then joined the board until the year 2000. So we talked about Best Buy before, but I was surprised to find out that Circuit City actually had the opportunity to buy (laughs) Best Buy. This was in 1988. Correct. Why didn't you take it? Well, first of all, I was... I was on the board, but no longer CEO. Um, my successor, and there's, we talked earlier about hubris. He said, why should I go out and spend $10, $20 million and buy Best Buy um, when we can just open a store in Minneapolis and blow them away? And in fact, he opened a couple of stores in Minneapolis, and he didn't blow them away. They blew Circuit City away. Why? Why were they better? Well, it was their hometown. I mean, they were very well entrenched. Um, and they didn't blow us away, but they, we didn't capture the market. They maintained market dominance. Um, and it's hard to, ch- to take market dominance away from a local retailer that's selling at very low prices and giving you know reasonable consumer service. Actually, Best Buy isn't doing that well these days. Correct. Um, they're having trouble with this. The concept now is called showrooming. So Correct. people come in, they look at the stuff, they compare things, and then they go and buy it online for cheaper. Right. They don't even have to go. They can just turn around and pull out their cell On phone. On their smartphones. Right. And uh, even z- zap the, uh, the URL code, I mean the code on the, the barcode on the, on the ticket, and order it from Amazon or somebody else right there in the store. And in a, they don't pay, in many states, you don't pay any sales tax. So even if the prices were the same, it's, uh, you know, 5 to 8% cheaper, depending on the sales tax. It gets delivered the next day or two days later. So how is somebody like Best Buy supposed to survive that? Only by providing better service. And that's, tr- that's hard in a commodity product. The Best Buy v- was very smart early on, and, I mean, 2000-something, um, bought the Geek Squad. And the Geek Squad will come into your house and uh, set up your home theater, uh, set up your your uh, computer with a printer and the internet access and other things that most people find uh, challenging, and that's a very signif- it's a significant and profitable part of Best Buy's business, but it's only three billion dollars out of fifty billion dollars, so it can't be profitable enough to offset you know the the, the carry the total profit structure of Best Buy. Do you think they'll still be around and? Five, I, it depends how agile they are. I mean, I think they've got, they've got to figure out a strategy to um, provide a benefit to the consumer that Amazon and its like don't. So when did things start going bad for Circuit City? And they started going bad, I would say. I left in 86, and for the next 10 years, the strategy that I had created of these big back stores, I mean, not just me, but we had created, um, was very successful, and my successor took took the company from one billion, which is what it, the sales were the year I retired, to uh, ten billion, uh, and mo- and for in a, in fourteen years, and for at least half that time, we were the king of the hill. But in the middle in the mid nineties, Best Buy started creeping up on us, and so the problems for Circuit City began, in my opinion, when my successor was un- unwilling to change the strategy. Uh, so, but was it an unwilling to change the strategy or an unwillingness to see that the strategy needed to be changed? Well, some of each. I think he understood intellectually. I mean, the strategy we're talking about is that Circuit City was built on the, on the theory that sales the customers are not all that familiar with the product. It's a big ticket purchased for many families. They need reassurance that they're making the right decisions. And a salesperson, uh, pr- properly trained, uh, can help them make the right decision. Now, these were commissioned salespeople. The, and these are commissioned salespeople, correct. Best Buy decided they didn't need commissioned salespeople. Um, people knew enough, uh, had research or whatever, talking to friends, that they could come into a store like a grocery store and pick it up, put it in a shopping cart, and take it to Central Checkout. We didn't have any of that. My successors believed that if we did that, people would buy the down and dirty cheapest item with the least features, the least gross profit, 
and they wouldn't buy the extended service policy, which was an integral part of the profit structure of Circuit City and, and most other uh, chains. And so he was unwilling even to test whether or not a, a more, uh, you know, grocery store approach, maybe a mixed floor where some customers could decide, do I want to talk to a salespeople or do I want to take it to the checkout? Uh, ideology, which is one of the habits of mine that I talk about in the book, in that case, ideology trumped evidence because the evidence around them was that people liked that. That's why Circuit City stores stayed in the 90s from at, in the 10, $12 million range and Best Buy went from $10 million to $40 million per store, a staggering increase. And things continued to go from, from bad to worse for Circuit right. City. When, when my successor, who was a very smart guy and, and did a great job in building the company uh, up to a certain point, retired, his successor understood we needed to make changes. He, un- he, he talked a lot about changing the business model, expanding the floors. But it was obvious that, they, that you needed to make some changes. Yes, in and he city. articulated them, but he couldn't execute. Why? I don't know. You have to ask us. <laughs> I, I, it's not clear. He was reluctant to, uh, to, to create consensus. He didn't like conflict among people. Uh, he didn't too try eager to, to please. Iron, too eager to please, right? And ultimately, he was too eager to please Wall Street. Because to remodel the stores was a multi-billion dollar investment. And he feared, and it, with some justification, that Wall Street wouldn't, re, wouldn't like that. Because this was not a new business. This is sp- applying a lot of money into an old business with that, to save it more than to dramatically improve its, its current profitability. Uh, in my opinion, the right strategy would have been go private. And he could have done that and do make these changes out of the glare of, of you know, uh, the SEC and publicity, uh, and then come and reemerge as a public company again, which many, many people have done. But he was unable to make these hard decisions. Uh, he retired, and his successor, who d- didn't understand the, the Circuit City culture of the way to treat people, which is what well, built it. Well, about his successor, you say this, uh, quote, it would be hard to overestimate the damage that Phil Schoonover inflicted on Circuit City. It's a bit harsh. Uh, well, I've tried to be as objective as I can. I mean, the challenge in writing this book is to tell the truth and, and objectively. I've interviewed a lot of people. I've read all the SEC and annual reports and, and try to come to some balanced judgments. And I, and I think that's a balanced judgment. He, uh, For example, at one point, he fired 3,400 salespeople overnight without warning, um, they were the highest paid, most productive commission salespeople that we had, but they were making too much money. I mean, that was probably objectively true, but the way to do it was not to do it with no warning and fire them overnight and say, oh, you can reapply for your job in six weeks if you want it, if you'll come back at $15 an hour or some such number. He did immeasurable damage to the culture to the uh, esprit de corps, to the sense of, of belonging to a worthwhile organization. And that, that's hard to recover. How does a company or an organization keep the culture from successive leaders? How do you maintain that? <laughs> it's with great difficulty, but, but you, you make changes slowly. Uh, and, and you do it with a full explanation to people of why you're doing it. And, and moderate the effects as much as you can. We could have converted those 3,400 people, many of them, to non-commissioned salespeople. They might have been making less money, but if they were transitioned and you did it gradually and said, look, if this doesn't work for you, we'll help you find another job, it would have maintained the culture, would have maintained a sense that this was a worthwhile company to work for. So, Alan, what were you doing while... Mm-hmm. Circuit City was in this death spiral. Um, basically, I, uh, I became a angel, an angel investor and have invested in a number of but startup I companies. Help but thinking when I was reading this train wreck that was right. happening was, wait, where is Alan? Why didn't he step in and say, hold on, this is, this is going the wrong direction. We need to do this. Well, I did. I stayed on the board to 2000 and I was a squeaky, a squeaky wheel on the board. 
I hope not obnoxiously, but so but but my positions were were clearly understood, and the management and particularly the new set of directors we were more inclined to support existing management because they were not retailers. Um, didn't want to hear it or didn't 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 want to act on it. But this is your baby. I mean, this is your dad's company. Right, but it's a public company. I mean, the the Wurzel family owned a few percentage by a few percent of the stock by that time. So um, I, I voiced my opinions. They were not listened to, but that's the way boards work, you know. I, I had no resentment of that. Uh, then I left in 2000, and uh, I lost, you know, any, any contact with the company in, in an official way. I had friends and knew what was happening by reading the papers, but I had no inside information. Why did you leave the board, though? Uh, <laughs> I left the board because of silly quirks in... Uh, in corporate governance, uh, the California Pension B- Benefit Board, CalPERS, that's, I've, I've got, CalPERS is the right name, I, I'm not sure what the acronym stands for. CalPERS believed that former CEOs should not stay on the board because they thought it would be too, they were too cozy with existing management. They didn't know that I wasn't cozy with existing management. I was speaking, you know, uh, against a lot of the policies that Circuit City was then uh, pursuing. But uh, Circuit City's fortunes declined. CalPERS moved in and said, oh, there's a company that's going down. We've got to make a change in the board. And that was one of the changes they, uh, they pushed for. So, Alan, what do you regret the most about Circuit City going out of business? Oh, I regret the most the, the damage it did to the families. Of, I mean, there were thousands, tens of thousands of hardworking, loyal em- employees, people who've been with the company 10, 20, 30 years, grew up with the company, uh, loved it and, and gave it their, their, their best shot. And then in return, the company sent their kids to college and bought them better houses and, or enabled them to buy better houses. And these people were in a, overnight were washed out and uh, on the street, Look, and many of them in their 50s, some in their 60s. Uh, they couldn't find work. I felt uh, terrible about that. Alan Wurzel, he's the former CEO of Circuit City. He was CEO from 1972 to 1986. The book is Good to Great to Gone, The 60-Year Rise and Fall of Circuit City. It's published by Diversion Books. Alan, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you for inviting me.